things happen and is a wonderful partner. So thank you, Melissa. Thank you again. So as the director of the Wegland Endowed Chair for Multicultural Studies, I'm really excited to share with you our uh, second speaker for our social justice series. Some of you were here last time, and I think many of you were not. So I'm going to share a little bit about Michi and Walter Wegland. How many of you have been to the event before and heard about Michi and Walter? Okay, all the faculty right? <laughs> in the room. So Michi and Walter were incredible friends to our former president, Bob Suzuki, and his wife, Agnes. And back then, they loved this campus so much, especially the work that we were doing around social justice and addressing inequality, that they wanted to gift us with an endowment. And so, hence, we have an endowment that's completely committed to issues of social justice and equity across higher ed, but around society. They're also interested in transnational and global issues as well. So Michi was a survivor of the Japanese internment. And for those of you who came to Dana Nakano's talk last time, you heard that we had an internment concentration camp right here at the Fairfax, but also at the Santa Anita racetracks and a lot, a lot of different areas. They're holding, holding cells for folks who are being pushed aside and moved to different parts of the West Coast. Walter was a survivor of the Holocaust, and he escaped Jewish um, persecution and the Holocaust and came to the United States. And so both of them had this shared, weird parallel experience of both being, obviously the Holocaust was horrible, there were more death camps as opposed to concentration camps. And for me, she as a teenager was in the internment camp. They met in New York, fell in love, and then they got married. Michi was an incredible costume designer. I'm still working with the Smithsonian to try to see if we can get some of her original drawings into the Smithsonian. And Walter was also very creative. He was a chemist, a perfume chemist. So many of the perfumes and colognes that you may be wearing today, who knows, may have been the, I don't know, the many just may go to Walter. Both of them have left such an incredible legacy, and I'm so honored to be able to direct this wonderful programming for all of you, but I did not do this alone. As I mentioned, Melissa, I don't know, she moved somewhere, Ortiz, she's, she's my right hand, left hand person who is just a really wonderful partner. But I'm also really thankful to have a lot of faculty members, not all of them who are here, as well as staff members who serve on the advisory, advisory committee. So if I could just have you just wave your hands really quick, wave them in the air like you just don't care. Okay. And then we're going to start doing karaoke. I was joking, like, no day bomb right here. I'll start singing twice. Watch out for K-pop bands. So anyway, so I am so excited for the second speaker of the social justice series. And I'm going to look at my notes because he is so accomplished. I do know a lot about him. I have known um, Dr. James Zarzadias. I always mispronounce <laughs> his name. It's hard for me for some reason. Um, we just said, it's been 15 years. I met him when he was a grad student. I was somewhat of a fresh faculty member here at Cal Poly Pomona when I was an incoming president of the Association for Asian American Studies and he was a graduate student rep. I had no idea that he was so accomplished even before I met him. So I always think of him as a sociologist, but he is a historian. <laughs> and I always say, you're a sociologist. But he got his bachelor's in American studies at George Washington University in American Studies and Political Science. And then he went on um, to pursue his master's and PhD in history at Northwestern Uni um, University. And by the way, Ethan Cobble says to say hello. Ethan, say Hi, hello. Ethan. <laughs> uh, he has a lot of folks like Natasha Shama and other folks who are so, so proud of him, professors, um, one at Northwestern, one at University of Hawaii. He is an associate professor of history and the director of the Yuchenko Philippine Studies Program at USF, University of San Francisco. So I'm a Bay Area, somewhat of a native. I grew up there, and my sister went to USF, so very familiar with it. But what, what the lens that he provides is that he specializes in urban and suburban history, Asian American history, and the 20th century United States. Um, he's received multiple awards for his work, and we are so excited to have him here because he is talking about an area that many of you are so familiar with because we live right next door to it. So as resisting change in suburbia, Asian immigrants and frontier, frontier nostalgia in Los Angeles. But what he really does is talk about San Gabriel Valley. 
So what we're going to be doing today is really hearing from James about his work, um, providing some insights and reading some parts of it. And then we're going to have a conversation with Dr. Lorraine Holm, who is at Political Science. She is so excited also when I when she heard that we were planning on inviting Dr. Nasir Zara's Adieu. I don't know why I have a hard time with your last name. Uh, she's like, oh my gosh, and I said, do you want to have that conversation? And absolutely, because she is a, also a policy and urban planning expert in the field of Asian American studies. If you signed in today in the roster and the survey, as well as on the QR code, at the end, we will be raffling off nine of these books for you to take home. And Dr. Z will be able to sign, sign it, woo -hoo, and sign off on the book and you know have a conversation. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And without further ado, I would love to welcome Dr. Z to Capital. Give him a big welcome. Okay. So um get this right. Well, hi everyone. Um, thank you for that really nice introduction. Let me try to put this water here. I'll leave it. Um so I want to thank everyone that's here today. I want to thank especially Professor uh, Mary Danico. I want to thank Melissa Ortiz, um, Dr. Holm as well, and really um, everyone that's here today. And I also want to acknowledge the generosity of uh, Michi and Walter Weglin and the California Center for Ethics and Policy for providing scholarly spaces um, like this one here at Cal Poly. Um, Cal Poly is in many ways my hometown university. Um, so I grew up very close by. This is why I'm very, very happy to be here. I grew up in Walnut. I went to Roland Unified Schools. So Oswald, Rincon, and Nogales. This is a Nogales kid, uh, so I know the area very well. Um, my family still lives in the area. They moved from Walnut to San Dimas several years ago. So thank God for that, because it was running late today, <laughs> and I got here in good time. Um, so I'm very much, uh, this is, Again, my neck of the woods. And so this is one of the first book talks I'm giving, and I'm so glad it's here at Cal Poly, because this is really my, my home. And so, you know, I have to, you know, admit that, you know, it's been a few years since I've been at Cal Poly. I did research here several years ago. I'm a little bummed that that, was it the CLA Tower's gone? <laughs> um, because it's, it was very, I don't, safety first, I get that, but it was such an iconic building, and when my family moved to San Dimas, every time I was driving right on the 10, you know, 57, I'm like when I saw the tower, I was like, I'm almost home, right? So I'm like, I'm sad as it's gone, but I'm sure something else will, um, remarkable will, will appear. So anyway, um, I want to um, just say again that because I'm a hometown boy, I really want to just be really casual with this talk today. And, you know, I'm with a friendly crowd of folks that, again, are from the area or have connections to the region. And I really want to just talk a little bit about this place that a lot of us affectionately call the SGV, the Sangerbo Valley, um, the 626, the 909, right? All of those things that we call the SGV, the Sangerbo Valley. Um, and I want to share just a brief backstory as to why I wrote Resisting Change in Suburbia. Um, you know, really for me, this isn't just, you know, about where I grew up. There's a bigger story here uh, about what the development of this region means to not just Southern California history, but how we think about suburbs in general across the United States. So I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, I also want to talk about how, in many ways, you know, this is, um, you know, a lot of the residents who moved here, whether they moved here in the 1960s or the 1990s or the 2000s, had very much um, a set of expectations of life in the East Sangerville Valley. So we want to talk about that as well. Right, so we'll read a few passages as well, give you a sense of the book, um, kind of give you a sense of my overall research interests, especially if I'm new to a lot of you. Um, and also, hopefully, kind of pique your interest to encourage you to buy the book. <laughs> um, and, and just read it, tell your friends and family. So, all right, so let me, actually, I'm really, you know, historians are notorious for being terrible at technology, and so you're gonna have to bear with me, all right? So, um, if this works. Not moving. Oh, it's not on. See? There you go. <laughs> I'm really old school in my classroom. There's hardly any slides. So, anyway. 
All right, so uh, again, this is the cover of my book. Um, and um, you know, one of the things that I uh, try to do as a history professor, as a scholar, is to be as engaged with the public as much as possible. I think that you know, anyone that is able to go to college is in a privileged space, and not everyone is, has the opportunity to do that, right? To sit in a classroom and read books, read articles, engage with a professor, or faculty member, and librarians. And so one of my goals always is to try to make scholarship accessible to everyone. And so sometimes I'll write, um, you know, op-eds or articles for different media outlets. And Jermaine, and apropos to our conversation today about the San Gabriel Valley, you know, I had a couple of op-eds recently about um, this region that we're standing on right now. And I wrote about um, in October about um, you know why a lot of Asian immigrants, in particular, moved to the East San Gabriel Valley. And unfortunately, I wrote another op-ed for a sad reason, which was the recent shootings in Monterey Park. Right, and um, you know, for a lot of us in this room, I suspect that the Sangro Valley again is very personal to you. And when I heard that news about what, the shooting at Monterey Park, um, not only was I disturbed, but it really did eat me alive inside. In the sense that those spaces, right, those um, dance halls and festivals and venues, you know, that a lot of Asian and Latinx families go to, that's very personal and very um, meaningful to a lot of people. My own mother, who's a retiree now, she goes to these types of dance halls. And it was very distressing to hear that news. Any mass shooting is absolutely awful. But given how close to home that was, that really, it broke my heart. And why I wrote this piece um, is to not just talk about, you know, Monterey Park and what occurred there and the tragedy, but also to think about, you know, why these spaces that are very, mundane and pedestrian to a lot of people have a lot of cultural significance. These are strip malls, but they're not just strip malls, right? They're gathering spots. There are places where people build community. And so uh, I wrote a little about that. And also thinking through about these last few years, particularly for Asian Americans, how, since March 2020, how challenging it's been to be Asian in America uh, and, and being subject to all forms of discrimination and bigotry and being blamed for things like COVID and all these other things. And so when we heard, a lot of us heard the shooting in Monterey Park, you know, unsurprisingly, a lot of people thought immediately, oh, well, the perpetrator was someone who didn't like Asian people. Well, the perpetrator was Asian American, so then what does that mean then, right? And it was regardless of whether the perpetrator is Asian, you know, that's not really the big issue here. It's just a reminder of how on edge Asian Americans have been for the last few years. Um, especially what happened in Atlanta, and again, all these other examples of violence, racist violence. Okay, so let's go into the book now, and a little bit about the process. So, growing up in San Diego Valley, I knew I came from a unique community. Multiracial, multi-ethnic, and in between rows and rows of tracked housing, architecturally inspired by the Italian Riviera, the English countryside or the old pastoral west were countless strip malls with Chinese eateries representing every corner of the diaspora. So these are just, you'll see some visuals of types of architecture that are probably familiar to a lot of you uh, in these communities that I'm going to talk about in a moment. And for me, you know, it, I, I, and there was something very um, unique about the San Gabriel Valley that I knew but it wasn't until I left, right, that I realized how special and interesting it was. So you have countless strip malls with Chinese eateries representing every corner of the diaspora. You have Filipino shops specializing in remittances, clothing, or bric-a-brac from the homeland. Buddhist temples and Korean evangelical churches next to restaurants specializing in Sundubu or Solontang. Basically, you know, anything that you wanted that's Asian, Asian American you can get from the San Diego Valley. And 20 some years ago, I thought to myself, you know, at 20 something years ago was, you know, I was a teenager here uh, at Nogales High School thinking, surely not everyone lives like this, <laughs> right? That these are not the typical landscapes of the American suburb. When I moved out east for college, um, my curiosity and appreciation for the San Diego Valley's novelty as a diverse suburban region only grew stronger. And being a bit of an explorer, um, I'm kind of telling you a little bit about how I came to this project, um, I fully, fully utilized the metro system in Washington, D.C. So I'm a terrible driver. I do California stops. 
I got parking tickets, so this is why you don't want to be behind the wheel. <laughs> um, and so I rely on public transit a lot then and there. And what occurred to me as a student in Washington, D.C. was, you know, I would go around these communities, not just in the city of Washington, D.C., the District of Columbia, but I would go to different metro stops out of curiosity, right? And I would go to these suburbs of Maryland and Virginia. And it was there where I found myself in landscapes in suburb after suburb that um, were simultaneously foreign and familiar, as I would say. So strip malls, large shopping centers like with anchors like Macy's and JCPenney, the cute chapel across from KFC or Chili's, my per personal favorite um, chain, um, shout out to Chili's, all these things that are familiar to us, right? Um, and at these malls in Maryland and Virginia, I'd stop, you know, in between like getting an Auntie Anne's pretzel, because you know, you can't get the boy out of the suburbs, right? You can't, I'm the same guy, right? Um, I saw myself thinking, you know, these again spaces are so everyday and common, um, but at the same time they were foreign to me in the sense that I wasn't seeing the landscapes we see in the San Diego Valley. Right? So even though a lot of my book focuses on Asian Americans and the Asian American communities here in the East Valley, you know, I also grew up, again, I went to Nogales High School, where you had pockets of Latinx communities, right? And strip malls, particularly catering to Mexican, Salvadorian, you know, um, immigrants and, and their families and all of these things. And so it was very, I was very accustomed to seeing that, right? And going out East and not seeing it as frequently, they exist, but that was something that I found um, interesting. So, Asian cultural expression in the built environment was seldom found in these places, especially in the residential parts. And here um, was where I saw the quintessential American suburbs that I knew from books, television shows, and movies of my childhood, right? So the suburban neighborhoods with tree-lined streets, homes with white picket fences, and behind those fences and behind those red, blue, and green double doors with the you know gold knob, right, were white families. And these were suburbs that I knew all too well as a consumer of American popular culture, uh, but again, it was somewhat foreign to me. These landscapes didn't fully align with my idea of suburban living as a native of Southern California, especially from this region right here, which is the San Diego Valley. So I want to show you the map, and this is also in the book. Um, so I'm not talking about the whole San Diego Valley. I want to be very clear about that. As a researcher and a lot of the faculty know this, and grad students probably know this too, and, and certainly if you're an undergraduate, you should know this too when you're doing research. You, we have these grand plans, right? We want to do right, the big narrative about a subject, um, but you just can't possibly do it and do it right with justice, right? So for me, when I was writing this book, um, there was a lot of, there's actually a lot of scholarship about the West San Diego Valley. So Monterey Park, Alhambra, uh, El Monte, Montebello, that region is well covered. Of course, I welcome more, right? Um, but when I was thinking about the whole San Diego Valley, especially my San Diego Valley, the east side of the San Diego Valley, it, we're not reflected in that scholarship, whether it's history, sociology, you know, political science, and all the disciplines in between, there's less scholarship out there about it, right? There's some great work, Dr. Ochoa is here, uh, who's given, done a lot of that work as well. Um, so for me, I wanted to even narrow it down more. And so on this map, I know it's a little hard to make out for some folks in the back, but these are the um, communities of the East San Diego Valley that are cities and some unincorporated areas. And if you see on the map the darker shaded communities, there are six there that I highlight, Hacienda Heights and Roland Heights, which are unincorporated communities, Walnut, Diamond Bar, Chino Hills, and right here in Pomona was one of the communities I talk about in the book. All the more reason why you should buy it. Um, <laughs> it's a personal to where you are right now, right? And where your students and, and faculty. Um, and so I focus on these because in the time period that I focus on as a historian, um, the development of these communities was more or less around the same time, similar aesthetics um, and how they were built and similar demographics. And in the case of Pomona, I focus really more on Phillips Ranch. Um, because I found that to be a really interesting part of the city. Not that Pomona isn't as a, overall, but the way that Phillips Ranch developed. How, how many of you have been around Phillips Ranch? Okay, okay, I'm just curious, right? I think it's pretty clear, right, that there's a theme in which design-wise and, and feel that they basically latched on to. 
compared to the rest of the city of Pomona, right? And I talk about that in the book and how that came to be. So in the book, I talk about these six communities, and I focus on Asian Americans largely because in the 1980s, 90s, and 2000s, much of the public debate, scrutiny, criticism, and all of those things in between were directed at a lot of East Asian groups in particular, Chinese and Korean, lesser to extent Japanese, but as well, and Filipinos, um, Southeast Asian groups, right? And so for me, I felt that there was enough material there alone to write a whole book. Um, and it really, uh, again, this is kind of why I kind of kept those parameters, right? So again, I want to be clear, right? I'm fully aware of how ethnically and racially diverse the San Diego Valley is, but to keep the study tight and concise, that's the, the, the parameters of my study, okay? So, um, and so after all of these, you know, observations I made living out east, contrasting that with my life as someone that's a boy from Southern California, um, I wanted to begin this quest to understand everything. Um, and so right off the bat, I had a couple of questions and thoughts that came to mind. So the first question as a researcher, when I, the genesis of this book, was, was how the San Diego Valley became, quote unquote, so Asian, as a lot of people say, right? Especially the suburbs that I mentioned here, the six that um, uh, I focus on, in, in particular, Walnut, Diamond Bar, Roman Heights, and Hacienda Heights, and later on Chino Hills, right? I also wanted to know why Asian immigrants chose this part of California and this part of greater LA to establish themselves in America, right? What was so, what, what, what brought them here, right? Um, and I talk a little bit about this in the book, well, quite a bit about this in the book, that it's not just, you know, for practical reasons like wanting to buy an affordable home well, affordable at the time, uh, in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, um, but also um, other factors, right? Chasing the American dream. And part of that American dream is, you know, the single family home, a nice car, your children going to great schools, right? All of those kinds of ideas of the American dream, right? Um, security, basically, right? Feeling secure. Um, so those are other things. Some of the other questions I've asked myself as a researcher. Um, and there were so many, but I just want to, I'm posing these questions um, just to kind of give you an idea of what I answer in the book, right? Um, is the so-called typical American suburbanite still white, middle class, Christian, and conservative? Why did notions of the idyllic, manicured, and orderly suburb draw people to places like the San Diego Valley uh, and our neighboring regions like the Inland Empire and Orange County? Right? There's a similar aesthetic and, and culture, especially in the 1980s, 90s, and 2000s. Uh, why were myths of the suburbs, the American West, and the American dream so powerful? And how static or elastic were these ideas? And finally, again, there were more questions, but these are some. How did people react to change? Right? And, and that's obviously the title of the book, and that's a big um, uh, topic I discussed at uh, in great detail, you know, and I'm, when I'm saying change, it, I mean that in multiple ways. Changes in the built environment, so in other words, architecture and spaces and places. Uh, changes in demographics, race, ethnicity, class, religion. Changes in local culture. Changes in neighborhood and regional politics, right? Uh, I think sometimes people, um, are surprised to learn that this was, the San Gabriel Valley was the bastion of conservative right-wing politics for decades. Um, and I think that surprises some folks to know that history. Um, and so I track some of that change as well, at least pockets of the San Gabriel Valley. Not, I wanna be clear, not all of the San Gabriel Valley, but pockets of the San Gabriel Valley. So I wanna read now a few brief passages um, from the introduction to give a, a little taste of what's in the book for folks who not had a chance to read it yet or buy it. So let me go ahead and Okay, so here are some <laughs> book covers of, um, from a resident from Diamond Bar who self-published these two books. One is called Suburban Samurai, published um, in 2006, and another book uh, called When We Were Cowboys, um, published in 2009. So I'll tell you a little about who Carl Schoner is who wrote these books. So I'm reading the introduction. So if you have a copy in front of you, feel free to read along. It was a quintessential June afternoon in Southern California. Sunny, dry, and so hot that the car steering wheel was too painful to handle. 
I pulled up to a shopping center in Diamond Bar, a master plan community in Los Angeles' East San Gabriel Valley, also known as the East Valley. I met longtime resident Carl Schoner for an oral history interview in one of Diamond Bar's two Starbucks stores, three if you include the kiosk inside the Target on the other side of the parking lot. I'm a bit of an ethnographer, so I like to be very detailed about my exchanges with people. After we ordered iced teas, we got to talking about what living in the area meant to him. I wanted to meet Carl after discovering his self-published books, Suburban Samurai, and When We Were Cowboys. In the former, he wrote about the quote, and these are his words, the Asian invasion of the San Gabriel Valley, noting it was, quote, friend, a friendly invasion, but an invasion nonetheless. So obviously pay attention to the words there, right, the language. The latter is a set of stories of the uh, fondest, quote, fondest memories of all young people who were lucky enough to have grown up in the more open expanses of Southern California's San Gabriel Valley back in the good old days of the 1960s and 1970s. Again, this is coming from his book, right? So Carl's memoirs reflect two strands of how residents and outsiders alike understand the region's past and present. A once rural place filled with folksy equestrians, farmers, and ranchers, and contemporaneously, a collection of newer suburbs that, were, uh, that would be later known for their sizable Asian populations. In both works, Carl eulogizes a life he and thousands of residents experienced before the valley suburbanized and emerged as an Asian immigrant hub. It was a place people like Carl revered and reveled in until it was taken away from them, or so it felt. So, so when we uh, talk, and I, I won't go, I won't read the rest here, but just to kind of give you an idea, um, Carl embodied what a lot of white residents I spoke with, uh, how they felt, which was they felt that the San Gabriel Valley, in this case the East San Gabriel Valley, had changed so dramatically that it was basically unrecognizable, right? And that change that he says um, was, for him, something that he couldn't wrap his head around, right? And for some of these residents, it was um, that the disdain for the change was racially um, motivated, if you will, right? There was some, obviously, concerns, nativist um, beliefs around that, that change. But for some residents, white residents in particular, they felt that the change was not so much about the racial aspects of how the valley um, transformed, but it was also about how they felt that they lost um, touch with the community that they felt was central to their identity. We have to remember too that a lot of the settlers that moved here after World War II, and even prior to World War II, a lot of the white residents who moved here after World War II came from the Midwest and South. So they had a very, their idea and contextualizations of place were often rooted in their rural agrarian um, upbringings. And so for them, seeing mass suburbanization, but also happen, happening so quickly, especially all the growth that happened here in the 1980s and 1990s, well actually even before that, um, they just felt that it was too fast, too soon, um, and for them it was kind of um, everything they didn't sign up for, I'll put it that way, right? Um, so, try to move this here. So Carl, in, um, in his book, Suburban Samurai, he has this cartoon, and he, he, by the way, fascinating, right? He draws all of these visuals in the book, right? So he's a cartoonist as well, right, illustrator. And this one in particular stood out to me because it really did evoke how people see the San Diego Valley. So I know it's a little hard for folks in the back to see, but there's a, presumably a white man who is in a cow, has a cowboy hat on, and it says, and he's standing next to someone that is being portrayed as an Asian person. Um, it says underneath, you know, hi, it's not normal to prepare grilled tofu at a Western barbecue, right? And kind of a, a critique of, you know, uh, the new settlers in the East San Diego Valley, right? And part of the region, I don't know if you pick this up on your own, right? In the region here, we have this affinity, cultural affinity for the frontier, the ranch life out here in the, on the East San Gabriel Valley. Um, for, for example, I actually don't know if they still do this, but at Industry Hills, you know Industry Hills, right? Um, I remember growing up, 
in elementary school, we went to the annual rodeo, right? And I thought that was always fascinating. Um, you know, because to me, you know, these are full-fledged suburbs, but you had this rodeo, and it was part of that Western frontier culture. Um, and it wasn't just white residents that embraced the local kind of ranch culture, but also a lot of Mexican Americans, Latinx folks who can, that resonates with that kind of ranchero um, uh, culture that's also in the region. And so it was interesting to kind of get, um, have these conversations with Carl and seeing that this juxtaposition just didn't align. He couldn't see Asian people with the countryside. He couldn't understand Asian culture in relation to these notions of the Western frontier uh, that the East Valley embodies or embody, right? So, so again, when we think about the East San Gabriel Valley, um, we have to think about why it has a certain look and feel. So I want to read another section from the introduction, and I want you to look at these advertisements as I, as I chat here. Um, I, as a historian, we do archival research, right? We go into these archives. You know, I know a lot of people love digital stuff now, but I'm old school. I need paperwork. I need photographs. I need to touch it. I need to feel it. I need to see it, right? And so when I was doing research on the East Sangamo Valley, which, by the way, was really difficult because for a region that has so many people living here, a lot of newspapers, frankly, didn't cover the region a lot, as, as extensive as they could have, right? A lot of the attention from the LA Times or San Gabriel, even San Gabriel Valley Tribune to a certain extent, they focus more on the west side of the San Gabriel Valley, right? So I have to be creative with my resources. These are advertisements for, um, on the left side here, of Phillips Ranch, just right around the corner. And if you can see this image, I know it's a little hard to make out, it says, look what's become the biggest master plan community in LA County. And there's a picture of all these horses grazing on the hills, right, hanging on the hills, and someone that looks like a cowboy, right? This was from around 1980. Those of you, your historians in the room, the people love history, this is around a time that in America, broadly speaking, there's a fascination with the American West. Dallas Dynasty, these are famous TV shows at the time that were on there. This was a time when Ronald Reagan <laughs> was entering the presidency, the cowboy president from the West. So it makes sense that there was this kind of appeal on the right side is an advertisement for Diamond Bar um, in the 1960s that also embraced this. Uh, I don't know for a lot of folks who know that Diamond Bar was a ranch, right, for many years, cattle uh, throughout the region. They were a large producer of beef for a lot of the West Coast. Um, you know, now there's like, you know, an H Mart and, <laughs> you know, an Albertsons and things like that, but, but that, that, these were cattle grounds for many, many years, right? So, Here's another Phillips Ranch ad that you can kind of look at it here. I'm showing these ads to kind of give you a sense of how housing developers were marketing the East Valley in the 1970s, 80s, and 1990s. And oftentimes, and I mentioned this in the book, there's this attachment to the frontier, the Western frontier, country living is what I call it, and many of them called it, like this advertisement here. And you're saying you're not moving to the suburbs of LA, you're moving to this pastoral, bucolic, landscape, the last bastion of wilderness in LA County. And that had cachet, it had a lot of appeal to a lot of buyers at the time. Again, this was the 1980s, especially where a lot of that interest in Western culture um, and Western fashion, right? All these things that were um, uh, taking over America, right? Um, were coming into fruition. Um, several years ago, I did research at the Smithsonian and there's not a lot of stuff about the East San Gabriel Valley, but I did thankfully find some photographs by a photographer named Joe Dio, who captured these photos of Diamond Bar in 1980. Look at Diamond Bar in 1980. I mean, it looks completely different in the sense that if you see in the back there, it is truly wilderness, right? And I know it's a little hard to make out, but in the middle of all this wilderness are just plopped down are dozens and dozens and dozens of new homes. Right? And Joe Deal had this fascination with Diamond Bar for a reason. I don't know why. I'm curious. I wish I could ask, right? I wish there was documentation about that. But he got these fantastic photos, uh, and, and one of them is in my book, right? So you can see again how, how modest Diamond Bar was at the time. Uh, and now Diamond Bar is a pretty expensive community. Um, and, and it's interesting to see how that evolved as well. Okay, so more advertisements. So let me um, just read one more section, then we can start to kind of close out and have conversation, because I definitely want to have a chat with Dr. Holm. Um, so in the book, I argue 
That myths of American suburbia, the American West, and the American dream informed residents' expectations. Furthermore, I argue that residents' allegiances to the ideals, rhetoric, and iconography of country living shape their identities and subjectivities and perspectives, thus informing how they engage with civic affairs. Beyond politics, the, romantic, the romanticized fantasies of Western morality affected residents' day-to-day -day lives, from neighborhood aesthetics to where they shopped. For generations across the American West, people created the mythology of country living. East Valley residents made country living tangible, bringing it to life and giving it specific meaning as a unique suburban experience. For over four decades, country living widened residents' opportunities for material gain, social clout, or political power. It influenced how they defined or organized themselves and their towns in relation to the city, that is Los Angeles, and other suburbs, while also narrowing the scope of who or what belonged in these communities. Okay? So, I want to show just more visuals because the pictures are always fun, right? Um, and uh, I want to show again how, in the book I talk about this, how some builders actually intentionally targeted Asian buyers. And I didn't know that, I didn't think that. You wouldn't think that there would be these multinational, right, uh, or large building and uh, builders and developers who would say, we want Asian consumers, uh, Asian buyers. This is the earliest ad that I can find that was very directly, very much directly targeting Asian consumers. So there are three couples there uh, for this tract in Diamond Bar, Merlin Heights. Jerry and Air, uh, Jerry and Elfie Lee, Keith and Robin Brownie, and Arthur and Nancy John. Just based on the last names, one could um, uh, infer that they are East Asian, right? The two couples, um, uh, one on the left and one on the right, right? and a white couple in the middle. Um, and beyond direct advertising, I'll come back to that in a minute. Beyond direct advertising, um, there were other phenomena occurring. In the book, in chapter two, I talk about the feng shui house. Um, anyone heard of feng shui before? Yeah, okay. Um, happy to chat about that in Q&A. Something really fascinating that I found in the research was that builders like Shea Holmes, KB Holmes, which was Kaufman and Broad, um, William Lyon, these big developers, right? Some of them still exist today. Um, intentionally design homes in the East San Diego Valley with feng shui design principles in mind. With the intention and hopes that particularly Chinese families would buy these houses that were feng shui ready, right? So for those of you who are not familiar with the principles of feng shui, right? And I have a very loose understanding as some of the, my mom was into it for a while. <laughs> I remember that. Um, you know, you don't have, for example, a home where in the front door, there's a staircase right in front of you. Does anyone know what that means? Why? We're all in the classroom for a minute, in my classroom. Anyone know why that's bad? Yeah. Uh -huh. So, for those of you who didn't hear, all the, all the good energy in chi, right, so to speak, would ex exit the house, right? Um, there are certain things like the types of windows that are built, right? Um, you don't have, for example, a kitchen directly above the primary bedroom, right? Because the flames of the fire as you're cooking is going to be detrimental to one's marriage, right? So all of these types of things that are so fascinating, developers, largely run by white uh, Americans, were saying, we gotta build homes that are feng shui ready. And like hotcakes, they sold. And that's another reason that a lot of Asian families moved to places like Walnut, Dime Bar, and Roland Heights. At this period, the homes were basically ready to go for people who believed. So that was a really fascinating aspect of the research that I did not expect, right? My assumptions as someone that grew up here and as a researcher, I thought, well, it was kind of like a snowball story. One Asian family moves in, three more move in, five more move in, and lo and behold, you have a community of thousands of Asian families. And that was not necessarily the case. There was actual intention behind some of this. And obviously, to make money, right? A lot of these immigrants that came at the time were upper middle class or affluent, and they bought these homes oftentimes with just purely in cash, right? So there was a profit. The, the intention of making a profit was, was part of the, uh, the reason to do that. Right? So, um, a couple more things. I talk about in the book something else that might be of interest to, 
to uh, folks in the room. Um, I talk about 99 Ranch Market. How many of you have been to 99 Ranch Market? I assume almost everyone, if not everyone in this room, okay. Um, I call it 99 Ranch, people say Ranch 99, okay. Either way, um, I talk about 99 Ranch Market because in Walnut, just a few miles down the road, um, they talked about opening a 99 Ranch in the 1990s. And in the book, I talk about why that was blocked, actually. Um, and it wasn't who you thought that was vocally opposed to it. So a lot of, there were white residents who said, we don't want it in Walnut. It's, it, they associated Asian shopping centers as de classe. Uh, it's gonna attract a lot of traffic, all of those things. But actually, one of the most fascinating aspects was that a lot of Asian immigrant homeowners themselves did not buy an Iron Ranch in their community. And a lot of the logic that came from that, and I, I did oral history interviews with Asian residents there, and I asked them why, and they said, we just don't want it to be like Roland Heights. We don't want it to look like Monterey Park. And for them, they, their class status as middle class, upper middle class, affluent Asian immigrants, the homeowners in these upscale communities, they, they felt that this was all about property value, right, and resale value. And they felt that if this place, Walnut or Diamond Bar, became like Roland Heights or Monterey Park or City of Industry, that it would not be a desirable place anymore, right? And so in the book, I talk a little about that kind of internal stuff within the Asian American community that is about class, right? That is not often discussed in the scholarship. So here is Hacienda Heights' 99 Ranch. And as in contrast, you can see there's Chinese lettering and English translation. Chino Hills, which I also talk about in the book, they opened a 99 Ranch, but that, there was a lot of struggle in opening that one in Chino Hills. If you notice that one in Chino Hills, and this was taken just, I think, a couple years ago, that 99 Ranch mark does not have Chinese lettering. And it also emphasizes, it says 99 Ranch Fresh Market because of the stigmas around Asian supermarkets or ethnic supermarkets, broadly speaking, right, including Latinx, uh, markets as well that have a bad reputation for some people, right? So I talk about that as well in the kind of fights around, you know, ethnic expression, cultural expression, and rights to the suburbs, right? So just to conclude, um, as a historian, as an urbanist, as an ethnic studies scholar, I want anyone and everyone who picks up resisting change in suburbia to grapple with, complicate, and interrogate the idea, the image, and the word suburb. I hope readers walk away with a newfound understanding or greater appreciation of how matters of race, class, space, and citizenship collided in unusual ways in the late 20th century, particularly in this part of Southern California. Finally, while my book is focused on the East San Gabriel Valley, this is ultimately a story about the incredible power of myth in contemporary American life, specifically myths of the suburbs, myths of the American West, and myths of the American dream. Ideas white residents and Asian immigrants that I talk about in the book, as well as their children, alike, what they, how they believed in all of these ideas, how they subscribed to them, and how they organized their lives around myths such as these. And really for a half century, as, you, as you'll read about in the book, or if you already read in the book, people went to great lengths in the San Diego Valley to protect these myths illustrated, right, they illustrated truly the tremendous hold these cultural fictions and ideas had over people, not just stateside, right, not just in California, but worldwide, right, and that's something that I want us to think about, and hopefully when you read the book and you walk away, that these are questions that um, you've been chewing on and hopefully you have some answers to. So that being said, I want to thank you all for listening, for engaging, and I want to transition to a conversation with Dr. Holmes. So thank you. And Lorraine, feel free to take them off. James, you can take yours out. Yeah. So, Screw over there. So we're just gonna have a chit chat, um, and then of course we're gonna have uh, some yeah, Q and A. I want to make sure there's some time for um, yeah. for Q and A from folks. I have to um, 
Full disclosure, I am not a local. I was uh, raised in San Francisco. So I'm going to have some like slightly outsider um, questions. We traded locations. Yes. Now that I'm based there. Yeah, yeah. so different, slightly different perspective to um, San Gabriel Valley. Um, so I actually wanted to start off because I'm glad you mentioned your personal relationship yeah. to the area. Sure. Um, and being a, like an ethics studies scholar too, yeah. a lot of us study um, our own communities, right? And the personal really um, shapes our research. And I know you talked a little bit about your, um, your trajectory and how you got to your research question, et cetera. And so I'm curious though, as you were doing your research, were there moments where that were just like these aha, like affirming moments, like as you were now doing your scholarship and reading about and San Diego Valley, whether it was from other scholars or um, your archival research that were like, this makes sense. Suddenly my childhood experience or my adult experience makes sense. Or conversely, was there anything that you were realized, well, this is actually really different than what I experienced? Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I think a lot of, that's a great question. I think for me, and I'm not sure if I'm directly answering this question, but I, as a researcher, you know, students will ask me sometimes, like, you know, how do you, how do you do research, right? Where do you begin? And for me, I, I always say it has to be a topic that you're obviously genuinely, genuinely interested in. Um, I think for me, it helped that I grew up in the area, so I have a, in some ways, I, I'm able to have an insider's take, but I think that was one of the challenges too, right? It was actually having to divorce yourself from the region and your personal connections. Um, so that was also, again, a challenge. Um, but something, you know, kind of going, like, was it an aha moment? Um, for me, it was the, one of the examples I talked about with the feng shui homes, right? That, that made a lot of sense. Um, another aha moment was um, more like observing a theme, right? When I was doing research on these communities, um, to me, they were just suburbs, right? Just like ordinary suburbs. But when I was looking at these advertisements and photographs, some of them that I posted or that I showed a moment ago, right? Um, there was a theme that people were alluding to but not saying explicitly, and it was, again, this whole idea of living in the frontier. For whatever reason, there was something about um, how advertisers um, talked about the region as if that this was the wild, wild west. And I never really thought about it like that growing up here. I, to me, these were just you know conventional suburbs, right? Track homes, row upon row of them. Um, but when I, when I drove around the community as a researcher, and I moved here, for a year, a little over a year, to do really deep, intense research, I was like, okay, a lot of this is making sense. The street names that are named after certain people that were former cowboys or landowners, um, the the kind of romanticized track names, all these things were making sense because it wasn't necessarily the residents themselves that were creating this language or this idea of the region. Partly that was the case, but oftentimes these creative I don't know, what I call creative work of building communities, um, was coming from the developers and realtors who were pushing out a lot of these ideas. So when you're looking at, for example, like I was looking at um, housing ads, right, in LA Times, Orange County Register even, San Diego Valley Tribune, um, it wasn't necessarily just developers, but realtors were saying, um, buy this home in Phillips Ranch and you're living in the middle of the ranch as if it's the 1800s again. Right, um, and you know you have a grand driveway, but you also have access to wonderful horse trails that are that suit the cowboy, right? And these were advertisements from like the 1980s. You know what I mean? Like, how many people own home? You know, horses here still. At that point, regionally, a lot of you know I talked to a lot of residents. One of the questions that I asked, especially um, for white residents who who felt the area changed too much for them, I said, well, how about your neighbors? And they said. Oh yeah, a lot of them moved away. I'm like, well, where did they move to? Norco, Corona. I'm like, why? A lot of them have, quote, had homes, um, excuse me, horses. They needed more space, so they moved further inland. Um, and then many of them also said that their um, neighbors, uh, especially if they were white, moved out of state. Uh, Idaho, Colorado, Utah. Um, you know, there's a um, uh, 
critic, political critic called, um, his name's Rich Benjamin, he, wrote, he called them white topias. These white topias, what he meant by that is to say that a lot of white Californians who were dissatisfied with the ethnic diverse, you know, racial changes in the 1980s and beyond, they, they were like, California, this is not California, the California I signed up for, and they're like, we're gonna get out of here. And they moved to Idaho, they moved to Nevada, they moved to Oregon, and, um, and, and you can kind of get a sense of where, where that's going, right? So, so those are some examples of like aha moments or moments of like, this makes a lot of sense now. And it's not that I wasn't thinking about it growing up here, but I at least now I had concrete evidence, right? And it, it, and it crystallized in the conversations that I had with people. You know, as I mentioned earlier, it was hard in some ways initially to find research on the East San Gabriel Valley, because this was for a lot of people an afterthought. This region was not really important to especially journalists who do a lot of that documenting. And so that was a challenge, and, and I filled in those narrative gaps through oral histories and talking to people. And, and it was in those conversations that I learned even more about the kind of typical mindset, so to speak, of an East Valley resident, but also what happened here um, for histories that were not documented or that are not as fulfilling uh, in terms of information. Yeah, I'm gonna ask a slight methods question sure. here, but did you find it um, easy to f secure those interviews, especially if you're asking um, yeah. residents across race, right? Mm -hmm. And there's racially charged, like St. Gabriel Valley is being too Asian. Mm -hmm. Did you feel that um, it was easy, like people were willing to talk to you about that, or did you have to kind of develop quite a bit of rapport over time? Uh, all of those. <laughs> um, it, was, it was a little hard at times because it was more like, any, any interviewer I think can, can uh, attest to this. They're like, who are you? Why do you want to know about who I am, right? So it's kind of like, and, and, and if so, like, what are you going to do with that information, right? So there's all these obviously ethical things that researchers know that we, we sign off and all of these things and a protocol. And so, but once you let them know that this is a scholarly research, you know, project um, and that it helped that I grew up in the area, <laughs> um, that I was able to kind of break through uh, some of the, maybe the initial barriers. And then of course, once I had those interviews and they knew that it was, you know, there's no malintent, um, they're like, oh, talk to Jane, talk to Bob, right? And then I talk to them, they thankfully have a positive experience and they refer me to other people. So it gets at that classic snowball method of getting um, people uh, to speak with you. And I will say that uh, obviously, you know, an Asian American I identify as such, uh, even though I grew up in the area, I'm still Asian, and we're talking about matters around race. And of course, that was difficult to navigate at times, um, especially, you know, um, for a lot of residents who felt that they were not, that they themselves did not have racist views. Um, and unpacking all of that, right, was something that was also challenging, and reading, basically learning to read between the lines. So when they said certain words or phrases, like example, for example, change, that says everything, right? Um, and so that was a euphemism that I heard often and over and over again. That's why that word's in the title of my book, <laughs> because that often came up. They're like, I don't like change, right? Or there was, there's too many changes, right? Or it just changed a lot. And it kept, I kept hearing that over and over. But one of the things I talk about in the book too is that it wasn't just white residents who were dissatisfied with change, even some Asian residents themselves who thought that the area that they moved into, which was kind of reflective of America at the time when they moved in, in the 80s and 90s, you know, a mixture of different ethnic groups, even some of them said it changed too much. And for some people they said too Asian. <laughs> um, and so that was interesting as well. So. And that was another interesting aspect of the research process and the methods of getting people to talk to you and all those things. So. Right, and so you're getting into some of the dynamics of people wanting yeah. to preserve what they feel is a sense of place and sense yeah. of community that's very much anchored into when they moved into the area yeah. as well. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so um, you also mentioned, um, I'm, I'm glad you also said that you were studying East SGB yeah. specifically. Mm -hmm. I would say that, and you mentioned also in your talk that a lot of us, especially in the scholarship, really focuses on West SGB. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the differences too and how that might disrupt, you mentioned disrupting our notions of suburbia. Mm -hmm. I'm even wondering how we can disrupt our notions of what St. Gabriel 
Valley is mm -hmm. with your work too as well. Yeah, I, I, the, the short answer to this, because I'm sure I could talk a lot about this, so I'll keep it <laughs> concise. Um, when we're talking about the San Gabriel Valley in general, um, like any region, it, it, we can't just homogenize all these communities, right? Um, so when we talk about, for example, the East San Gabriel Valley, you know, Azusa, La Puente, um, Baldwin Park, Walnut, Diamond Bar, these, they all have different histories, demographics, and settlement patterns, right? Um, with the West San Gabriel Valley, the, the, the major differences that I would argue, and I write about this in a piece in the Journal of Urban History called Design Assimilation that I co-authored with Becky Nicolaitis, who's also a historian. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I recommend reading that. If, if, if a book is too much of a commitment, read the article um, where I talk a little bit about this. But um, what we talk about in this book is that the West San Gabriel Valley, a lot of the housing stock there are homes that were built around or right after World War II. So they're older. They're a bit more modest, right? They're a little bit closer together. Or they are old money houses like San Marino and parts of Arcadia that are, you know, the Huntington family and all those things, right? So in terms of the housing stock and the aesthetics of that side of the valley, there's not. In the East Angola Valley, a lot of the communities that I focused on that were popular for Asian Americans were really brand new communities uh, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Not all of them, but most of them had these new tracks. And so to me, it's the same valley. Aesthetically, there are differences, but as a result of those differences too, it's also, there's a direct connection between that and class. So um, in the West San Diego Valley, there are certainly pockets of um, Asian wealth in those, in, for example, Arcadia, San Marino, South Pasadena, and so forth. Um, but there's also more, um, in many ways, a lot more class diversity in some of those other areas that surround it. So Temple City, Alhambra, and so forth. And that's not to say that's not the case in the East Angola Valley too, but in the time of the study, 80s, 90s, and 2000s, there was, there was a, a increasing concentration of upper middle class Asians settling here. And in, you know, just to contrast this with more contemporary phenomena and changes, um, you know, after the East San Gabriel Valley was built out, so to speak, as, as some builders and, and planners call it, um, they're like, well, where else can we go now, right? Especially if, if houses are too expensive. So they go more inland, Ranch Cucamonga, more recently Eastvale, uh, Irvine, from decades now, actually, is another hot spot. Uh, and so again, the, it's about this kind of desire for new houses, but also places that have food school districts and all those things. Anyway, going back to your initial point, um, that, that's, some of the differences between the two sides of the valley, but the common strand of, of the valley, uh, whether it's east or west, is that these have always been ethnically and racially heterogeneous um, communities, and how they interact with each other, um, even with, internally within the Asian American community, varies by, by region, but also by class. And in recent years, one thing that I didn't talk about in the book, because it's still too as a historian, it's still too new, is that in the last decade and a half or so, you have an influx of mainland Chinese immigrants, right? And that's a difference, too, that, um, you know, something that comes up in some of the conversations are like, the ones that moved here in the 1980s and 90s, uh, the Chinese, they were coming from Hong Kong and Taiwan, mostly. And they have their own, um, some of them, their own discriminatory critiques of mainland Chinese, uh, around um, manners and and um, how they present themselves and how they acquire their wealth, all these things, and so that's something that um, you know, as as a researcher of this area, uh, and that is concerned about Asian American studies, right? That's something that I want to explore at a future time. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering related to that because you talked a little bit about home ownership and residents coming in. Mm -hmm. How much of those critiques and concerns are also coming from kind of transnational capital and investment? Um, in East SGB yeah. or even West SGB, but yeah. what are some of your observations about that? About transnational capital? Yeah, and I... how that's sort of getting into some of these um, conflicts, I guess, even internally within the Asian American community or yeah. even cross-racial. Yeah, I mean, the, the short answer is it's happening, right? Um, that you have, um, there's always a lot, not even just the San Diego Valley, across the United States, there's a lot of debates around, you know, uh, immigrants in particular and their right to purchasing land and property, right? Um, if we're talking about the East Valley, interestingly enough, a lot of the concerns initially in the 19, late 70s and 80s was not necessarily about the Chinese at first, it was a lot of Japanese capital that was coming into America, 
right? And there were a lot of, you know, you, you're a specialist, especially with LA, you know, there was a lot of concern about all the Japanese capital going into Little Tokyo, right? And then, you know, outside of Little Tokyo, they were buying, you know, properties elsewhere. And so there was some of the, you know, xenophobia kind of reared its ugly head at that time. And you hear that even today with some, uh, particularly with some Chinese Americans that are based in the area. So, should I open it up to questions? How much <laughs> yeah. time do we have? <laughs> yeah, yeah, any questions from the audience? Yeah. Just introduce yourself when yeah. you ask your question. Okay. Well, I'll go over here. Thanks, Lori. Uh, hi, my name is Raquel. Um, I haven't gotten the chance to read your book yet, no but <laughs> I did listen to your podcast episode. Oh, thank you. Um, thought it was very interesting. And I wanted to ask, um, it's a little bit of a longer question. Um, I was, you know, born in Alani, mm -hmm. raised in Azusa, mm -hmm. back and forth for, you know, the bulk of my life. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I'm second gen. Mm -hmm. I felt like seeing, uh, I, I thought a lot about signage and, and then urban planning, so okay. um, something very applicable there. Uh, seeing signs in Spanish always let me know mm -hmm. that, like, okay, I'm somewhere where I'm supposed to be, you know, <laughs> somewhere where I feel safe and welcome and I thought a lot about um, like really insular communities, like um, I don't know, just insular communities where there is racial homogeneity, and that offers you know safety and security. Um, and I thought a lot about what you said about um, just kind of a hesitancy about um, yeah, um, the East San Gabriel Valley being too Asian. And I thought a lot about even within like the Latino community, uh, the idea that you know, newer immigrants are being like looked down upon, um, even though obviously we're immigrants here as well. Um, and I just wanted to know, what do you think um, kind of contributed to that? Because I know you talked a little bit about too, the fact that, yeah, there was a little bit of bristling from white neighbors. So why do you think that um, the Asian immigrants living in these communities weren't more eager to see um, people from their community move in? That's a great question, and I appreciate those observations. I think the the short answer to that question is is that it's a classic tale of come in and shut the door behind you. And a lot of white residents, for example, who lived here in the 70s and 80s, for example, um, you know, in the case of the East San Diego Valley and the communities I focus on, there was some of that attitude, regardless of race, like this area is growing up, is growing too fast, too quickly. It's giving becoming too dense, right? And there were, in the 1980s especially, this whole, the whole San Diego Valley, west and east, was the epicenter, or one of the epicenters of the slow growth movement in California. I mean, if you don't know about it, check it out. We can talk about it afterwards. And basically a lot of anti-development or, or, or less development, right, uh, calls throughout the region. But how this connects to Asian Americans is that a lot of Asian Americans also got involved with that. And they, they, it was kind of like, okay, we got our piece of the dream suburb. We don't want anyone else to come here, right? And that attitude kind of trickled down generations, right? So those immigrants that moved here in the 80s and 90s that are from Hong Kong and Taiwan, middle class, upper middle class, affluent, they were like, okay, we got our slice of the American dream. We don't want anyone else now to come in, right? And and encroach upon that, make it dense, you know, the community denser and busier and all those things. And with the example of newer immigrants, in the case, for example, Asians, or a lot of next communities, Latino communities, um, you see, it's not surprising that sometimes people feel that way and hear that, because it's, it's something that across generation and race people feel. It's like, it's kind of uh, very much in line with a lot of like, you know, NIMBYism, <laughs> right? Some of that, that, that acronym should be familiar to a lot of you, especially planners in the room, right? So, so that's really what I, I find to be, it's, it's not always necessarily just rooted in racial things. It's also just kind of like, you know, we got a piece of the pie. We don't want you to have it either, right? Because now you're taking <laughs> taking more and more away of that, right? You're you're ruining the idyllic lifestyle that we came here for. So, yeah. Hope that answers your question. Yeah. Raquel, right? Yes. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Raquel. That was a great answer. Thank, thank you. Raquel. It. I have a question from yes. someone on Facebook. Oh, okay. So they said they missed part of your talk, but they want to know: Did you include how Filipino enclaves have changed over the last thirty years? I um, want to know if you if you've addressed Filipino enclaves past couple of years, and does West Covina still have the highest density of Phil and Also, how also how has the undocumented population changed within the 
API diaspora in the area. Okay, a lot of questions. So, um, well, I, Dr. Holm was going to ask one of those actually. Yeah. So, about Filipino American spaces as, as these spaces have yeah. As these suburban spaces have grown and become associated with Asian America, uh -huh. I, when I read your work, mm -hmm. I think of the older spaces, mm -hmm. such as like historic Filipino town mm -hmm. and LA, uh, Manila town, mm -hmm. that, that just have been devastated by yeah. urban renewal and basically yeah. forces to race, right? Mm -hmm. So how does this kind of your work in, in conversation with thinking about community building of Filipino yeah. Americans across space or doing our community building in new spaces as yeah. well too? Um, a couple of ways to answer that. Well, first of all, in the case of West Covina, right? um, I don't talk about West Covina directly in the book. Right? Uh, that's partly again because I was my my categorization, if you want to call it that, how I classify like, what communities to cover. It was more about again about like how certain communities developed similarly in terms of aesthetics and around the same time. So again, those six that I, I talked about. Right? Um, so West Covina didn't fit that qualification in my as a researcher for me. Because uh, it's an older suburb, by the way, um, and a lot of the housing stock is older too. Um, and so, and West Covina, just it, it's vast, right? West Covina, Pomona, uh, these are some of the big, and Pasadena, the biggest cities, right? Among the biggest cities in the San Gabriel Valley. So, to me, that was like that's a whole. I feel like you just have to have a separate book about West Covina, right? But, but that being said, um, with Filipino Americans, Filipino Americans are part of the composition of this book. Um, but I will say though that there was less scrutiny about Filipino spaces, and I think not even think it's they said this themselves. A lot of, a lot of it is because when we're talking about retail spaces like restaurants and uh, um, other businesses, right? Um, Filipino businesses were seen as less offensive because the signage was in English or the signage was in, in Roman letters, as they call it, right? It wasn't in Chinese characters, it wasn't in Korean um, you know, language or letters, right? And in some ways, they, I don't wanna say get, got away with more, but they were less scrutinized as a result of that. And a lot of the Filipino retail spaces and social spaces were in West Covina, which is a more, typically seen as a more middle-class community, as opposed to Walnut or Diamond Bar or Chino Hills that are upper middle class, where there's a lot more um, concerns around, you know, maintaining a certain look and culture of the region or those communities, right? That's the politically correct way of saying it, right? There's a lot of a, a lot of concern about, you know, keeping up a certain aesthetic and feel of the community. And West Covina has a lot more, has more, um, a less um, rigid regulatory culture around space. I'll put it that way too, right? Same thing with unincorporated communities like Rowan Heights, Hustling Heights. Um, so. That's one thing, was one aspect. Um, your other question was about Filipino like enclaves. Yeah, and just um, thinking about community building too, because mm -hmm. we often associate right. place making, um, settlement yeah. as community building, and mm -hmm. just that Filipino American spaces have been erased right, in yeah. a lot of ways too, yeah. right, through urban renewal, um, and right now we're thinking of even gentrification, what's happening right. in historic Filipino town in LA. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. and so how, how do these newer spaces in suburban areas, relatively newer, I guess yeah. you could say, kind of help to reestablish community, or if there's like a network of community? I'll say that, you know, in the case of whether it's a suburb or a city, right? So, for example, you, think you mentioned historic Filipino town here in LA, um, Soma Cultural District in, Phil in um, San Francisco, right? South of Market. Um, a lot of the um, kind of neighborhood activists and also cultural, you know, historic preservationists, they all all kind of basically are aligned with each other and, and team up regularly, including people in West Covina, because again, it's about um, recognizing and marking these spaces as very important landmarks for the Filipino community. I think, you know, in terms of the question of like kind of erasing them and all of that, you know, it's unfortunate that it took this long for, for the community to really um, address some of this. And part of it is because people weren't listening, right? Uh, city leaders and county leaders weren't. There's a, there's a way in which, with, in the case of Filipino Americans, and this is a whole other conversation I'm happy to talk, talk with you about later, is that Filipino Americans are either hyper-visible or very invisible, right? And that kind of experience of being Filipino American, part of it's just that long colonial 
uh, tie with America, that they're adjacent, right? They're attached to America, so in a sense, they're a part of the American, the fabric of the United States, but at the same time, they're still Asian, and so there's a, that kind of racialization as well. And so that also trickles down and translates into built landscape, built environment. And that, that, that's a challenge that I wish that, um, that I'm glad that there are more people in the community that are addressing that um, and, and more deliberately, but that's still something that we gotta work on, so, yeah. There were other questions? Other questions in the audience. Yeah. I'm not keeping track of time. Yeah, I know, yeah. <laughs> a little bit of time, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. I, I was noticing the, the uh, self-published uh, book that you mentioned. Oh, yeah. The first one. By Carl Schoner, yeah. Right, in the subtitle, Invasion. Yes. The word invasion, which is a powerful, militaristic word. Yeah. But I think it also signals, as we were talking about change, like, the signal. Um, it, it signals, I think, something about the American identity writ large, uh -huh. and that whether it's Ronald Reagan and you know all these notions of the frontier, mm -hmm. the frontier lifestyle, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then people of color. And you mentioned Asians and, and those who 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 resist other Asians coming in. Uh, likewise, uh, Elizabeth Elizabeth Wilkerson mm -hmm. in. The Warmth of Other Suns mm -hmm. talks about how some earlier or established African Americans resisted the Great Migration group as being less sophisticated. In other words, you know, this whole social stratification that is so prevalent in American culture, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it seems to resonate with some of the things that you were saying. Um, also, I, I noticed that you, you have some of the propositions from the 90s. I do. Uh, 187, 209, mm -hmm. to, uh, 226. And there was one in the 80s, Proposition 63, English as the official uh -huh. language. And around that time of 1986, English mm -hmm. as the official language, there was also, I don't know if it was Pomona or Monterey Park, mm -hmm. where there was a just a, 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 a national issue over the, the signage. And yes. I so, I anyways, I think yeah, I have something to say about that. But yeah, yeah. yeah. Last, last point. <laughs> I think it, it's sort of uh, for people of color. Yeah. In this uh, uh, issue of American identity, mm -hmm. right? Um, some people internalize that mm -hmm. and want to distinguish themselves on the social stratification right. from newer arrivals. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it kind of reminds me with. Uh, uh, this uh, wonderful documentary, Fear and Learning at Hoover Street School, oh, uh, yeah. the, the uh, uh, Pico Union, yeah. where a Mexican immigrant woman, uh, aide to the parent center at Hoover Elementary School, um, became a citizen, and then when she got in a car accident, assumed that it was an undocumented mm. driver, and then this litany of, you know, they don't care, they don't care about this, right. they don't care about that right. distinguishes themselves and the response from the dear friend that was kind of hurt and shocked mm -hmm. that she voted for 187 uh, was that you know sometimes we have to feel better we feel better about ourselves to the extent that we raise we perceive mm -hmm. as above the others in the social strata even right. in the same ethnic group right yeah no i i, I definitely you said that really nicely, right? There's this kind of like within, especially when communities of color, you hear a lot of that, right? It's kind of like um, some people, some people call it the crab mentality, right? And you know, that that's exactly what happened in some cases here in the in the book, where there's kind of like, you know, we don't want you here in this community because again, you're going to bring down property values. You're gonna there's there's this association a lot with Asian spaces. Like Nine Nine Ranch and, and and shopping mall strip malls that are that are geared towards Asian consumers as again day class A and not just that there's an association with that and density, traffic, dirtiness, all of these things that even Asian immigrants themselves bought into because they associate that as like this, the busy thoroughfares of Grand Avenue or Stockton Street or like Mott Street in New York right crowded sidewalks in the city produce spilling out into the streets. Um, uh, fish and seafood and all these other things that they, they they equate with that and they don't want that in their community because to them it's like we moved here to to get away from that right they but they patronize those spaces still right but they don't want it in their backyard 
But going back to what you mentioned earlier about the English signage, I talk about that as, as well in the book, um, and also even to a certain extent in the design assimilation article in the Journal of Urban History. Um, there were cities, um, some of them you mentioned. Uh, Monterey Park is another example, of course, um, uh, that we're trying to push for English only, or some cities called English also policies. So it was either has to be an all in English or something like 70-30. Right, so like 70% English and like 30% in a different language. But when those policies were being offered or were on the table, um, oftentimes it was the, the, the motivation, the genesis, genesis of it was because of the influx of Asian immigrants. It was, it was coming more so from Asian communities that had growing Asian populations in the valley. So you saw that in Monterey Park, you saw that in um, uh, Arcadia. You, um, it was a little bit quieter on the East Valley in the sense that things were done, I don't want to say like um, behind closed doors, but these were things that it didn't make as much noise um, for whatever reason. I talked about that in an article. Um, some of it was because it, there was a kind of tacit consent from Asian immigrants that if this policy is going to pass, so be it, right? There were, whereas in the West thing of Valley, there was a little bit more resistance, and there were some civil rights and civil liberties groups that spoke out, especially in the western part of the valley where you have um, Japanese Americans um, who were very vocal about that and coming to the defense of Chinese immigrants uh, because, you know, for obvious reasons, they were also targeted uh, and were dis discriminated against during World War II. So they have this, you know, alignment with the left that other Asian groups in the region had less um, connections to. So, um, we talk about that, I talk about that as well in the book, uh, and, and how that, it's not just about language, right? This is also about protecting an idea about the suburbs. I mean, it's really what it is in many ways. Um, of course, a lot of it's racial, and some of it is motivated by that, but some of it is too, it is also this idea that, why is there Chinese lettering? That's not suburban, right, as some people would say. Why is there a Buddhist temple, as you saw earlier with the Shilai Temple House, you know, some people say, that's not suburban, right? It's not a uh, Catholic church or a Protestant chapel or church. Um, that's not, to, to them, that fits the idea aesthetically and culturally of what should be in a suburb, and all the other stuff are transgressions. And, and it's, it, the transgressions are what people were getting more and more upset about. Look, one building here, one building there, you saw that there wasn't this, this mass like upheaval of, of anger, but when you started to see more and more, then, it's you know counterintuitive. It's not like there was like suddenly like okay I'm getting used to it. It was actually real backlash, uh, and oftentimes very uh, sometimes really um, nasty ones that would occur from city halls all over the valley, um, even in school board elections. <laughs> like it was it was insane, um, and and you know it really goes to show that the, the last point I'll say about this is that this was the 80s and 90s was also the time in America where multiculturalism, diversity, all of these things that's kind of the, the language that we use a lot today was really coming to fruition and it was coming, it was in some ways um, juxtaposed to the assimilation that people are expected to do, right? So on the one hand, immigrants are like assimilate, you're supposed to assimilate, drop all your Asian-ness or whatever your background is, but at the same time, they're in an America where people are saying, we embrace multiculturalism, we embrace diversity. And so it's that kind of, that, that conflict is why also it, there was a lot of confusion about how to proceed, right? How do you build this space that maybe is a Buddhist temple or a Chinese supermarket when you hear both poles, right? Saying, we don't want this here, assimilate. Or on the other side, we're like, we welcome you here, this is America, we're growing and becoming more diverse. So it's, it's a puzzling story that I, that I um, unpack in the book. <laughs> So, yeah. Yeah, one more question? Yeah. yeah. yeah please introduce yourself as well. Hi, my name is Jaden. <clears throat> um, first thing, I'm glad Dr. Holm gave us this opportunity to uh, <laughs> just basically explore what this is. I'm from the San Diego Valley, mm -hmm. and everything here, I, I spent my whole four years studying urban planning. Just see how I, I can improve my neighborhood, but the, meanwhile, I got lost in what cities are so great and just ignoring everything in my backyard, basically. I got mm -hmm. really tired of the suburban sprawl. I learned how to hate auto independence, all of that. And then basically in the past week we were discussing these topics, I'm like, wait, what happened? 
my whole purpose in studying this kind of got lost. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a Filipino American living in Temple City, mm -hmm. so I have no tie to the culture, no tie to the city. It's built on these people that I have no connection with. So it's really interesting how your study and research dives into that. And my question is, how how did you even start to think about researching these areas? Because um, Basically, as Asian Americans, you don't really see our history put on the mm -hmm. forefront such as this. Mm -hmm. We're pushed off to the side, we're not studied. Basically, we have no connection at all, mm -hmm. similar to how I have no connection with my own city. How did you start to have that spark and start to research your area? Yeah, thanks for your question. Um, Really, it, it, it's a combination of things. Um, some of it I talked about earlier uh, at the beginning of the presentation about kind of, you know, my curiosity about the region. But part of it too was frankly kind of like meeting a lot of Asian Americans all over the country that have a tie to the valley, have some ties to the valley. And some of it too was just uh, the emergence of, when I was starting this project too, was the emergence of an internet culture that, that really started to celebrate the San Gabriel Valley. You have the Fung, Fung Brothers, right? Um, yeah, and, and like other people who claim like the 626 and rep the SGB really proudly, right? And I felt like that was interesting to see Asian Americans occupying these public spheres of the internet and saying, why are we ashamed of being from the San Gabriel Valley? Yeah, it's not the West Side with all the glitz and glam, but it's, you know, it, it is a truly unique space. And, and so to me, it was almost kind of like, not just at a, a intellectual project and, and my own kind of curiosity as an academic, uh, and trying to fill in these, these gaps in scholarship and history and sociology and, and, and Asian American studies, but it was also kind of like, yeah, I want to rep my, my hometown. <laughs> I want to like talk about it because I, I too found it fascinating, you know, um, and, and that I, I, I say um, at the end of the book, and it's interesting that there have been some students at different universities I've talked to, and there's one line at the end of, of, the, of the last chapter, uh, I believe that I said that the Asian American, the contemporary Asian American experience is not an urban one, it's a suburban one. And, and I really mean that in the sense that a lot of Asian Americans today, West Coast, East Coast, the interior and the South, live in the suburbs, right? And, and it's not just that they live there, but they socialize in those spaces too, right? And so to me, that's again kind of how I came to this project, and that's where the source of inspiration came from. And as I was doing this research, ultimately, I felt this is not, again, just about the San Gabriel Valley, the East Valley, all of those, you know, all of the um, parts of this region. This really was telling me a story about how people really latch on to certain ideas and myths about what the suburbs should look, how they should feel, who belongs there. And that's the bigger story here uh, in this book. And, you know, hopefully, you know, some of that you're from the San Gabriel Valley, um, that, you know, um, that this resonates with you. Thanks for your question. Yeah. I think that's uh, the right. last of it. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks to Dr. Z, Dr. Holm, the library, um, and Center for uh, CCEP. I always get mm -hmm. the names mixed up. Um, thank you all. And then also our awesome colleague, um, Jill Del Choa, Dr. Del Choa is here as well. So thank you all. We do have some winners. Um, who, but you have to be here to get it. Oh. So your kind of your chances are really good. <laughs> so if um, if the people aren't here, they won't get it. You get a signed autograph book. They're lost. Yeah, they're lost. But let me see how many students are here. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. See what all of you get it. There you go. Perfect. There you go. Perfect. There you go. So all the students will. Get it, and sorry if you're faculty or staff, uh, you don't get it because Melissa didn't raise her hand and she gets it too. So, so thank you so much, and if you like to get your autograph book, James will, uh, Dr. Yeah. Z will be right there and it. have some conversation. But thank you so much again, thank you. wonderful. This was great. Thank, you. thank you so much. And our Facebook, Facebook folks were saying, this is great. I they still lie. We still lie. Yeah. Thank you for being here, too. <laughs> I think you're going to get some invites some okay. from schools nearby because they're messaging me. So thank you so much. Thank and thank you. you all for being here. Appreciate thank you. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Good night. Can we finish it? Yeah.